All right, guys, let's talk for a second or two about the steps that we take to protect the health of water systems. I think we would all agree that protecting the health of water systems is essential to life, right? And my guess is that if I had asked you when you were in third grade or fourth grade why water is so important, you probably would have said something simple like, because it helps us to live. That's something we kind of all know and hold as a truth, whether we can be more specific or specific about it or not. What I found to be really interesting on this particular slide is all of the different ways that water is important to us. You know, it supports our ecosystems. It, we use it for agriculture. It plays a role in providing fishing for us and recreation. It keeps public health strong and safe. And it provides us with healthy environments with a variety of organisms. So those are all of the reasons why we should care so much about the health of our water systems. So what do we do to ensure that our water systems are safe and healthy and that they can continue to support all of those uses over time? Well, the answer to that question is we've got lots of steps and programs to monitor and maintain water quality. That whole idea of maintaining water quality, we call that stewardship. Stewardship means to protect something that is important to you. So let's look at some of the steps that we take in order to steward our fresh water resources. And by the way, when we're talking about stewardship of water resources, our fresh water resources really and truly are the ones that are by far the most important to protect. Now, why? Why do we care more about freshwater systems than anything else? Well, the answer is easy, right? That fresh water is the water that we consume. You know, so if we're going to have access to clean drinking water, we're going to want to protect our freshwater systems. You can also think back to our first series of lessons in our hydrosphere unit, and you'll realize that access to fresh water isn't a guarantee for everyone. In fact, the vast majority of fresh water on Earth is either trapped in our polar glaciers or trapped into the ground as groundwater that's stored in aquifers. So even though there's a decent amount of fresh water on the Earth, access to that fresh water isn't super easy. So what does that mean for you and me? We better create some public health systems that can help us to protect those fresh water resources. Now, in the United States, the main organization that helps us to protect water resources is called the Environmental Protection Agency. It's known for short as the EPA. And round about the late 1960s and early 1970s is when the EPA was created specifically to help protect our freshwater resources. One of the steps that the EPA takes is to set different levels of contaminants that you can find in water based on the purpose for the water. So if water is intended for bathing or cleaning or drinking, we call that potable water. Okay, if it's intended for drinking water, then the EPA has more stringent standards about the amount of contaminants that you can find inside that water. If the water is used for transportation mainly and not drinking water, there's a different range of the amount of contaminants that you can find inside that water. And specifically what the EPA does is set targets for the 90 most commonly occurring contaminants that you can find in water sources. Now, what's interesting about those water quality standards that are set by the EPA is that they have to be regulated and monitored and maintained and enforced by both local, regional, and federal agencies. And here's the reason for that. You can't just say that water quality is good in your particular area because remember what we talked about when we looked at rivers and river basins. Water's always moving downstream, right? Any water that lands in a particular area is eventually going to travel through other areas. So the water that we drink, the fresh water that we get here, didn't just fall here, land here, and stay here. 
the water that comes to us here in Cary and in Raleigh is moving from upstream. Greensboro and Hillsboro's communities have an impact on our drinking water. And the water that we drink here in North Carolina or have an impact here on in North Carolina is going to continue moving downriver to communities like New Bern and Kinston, which are downriver from us. So it's when you're talking about water quality and maintaining water quality, we've got to remember that our water system is linked to many other communities. And the choices that we make are going to have an impact on other people too, which means that you need local, regional, and federal agencies who are all working together to monitor and support water quality. Now, when we're talking about monitoring water quality, there are two types of stressors that the EPA is most concerned about. And those two types of stressors are called point and non-point source pollution. Now, you can see some examples in this very first bullet. Runoff can become a form of pollution from urban regions and from agricultural areas. When you're talking about industrial factories, that can have an impact or provide pollution to a community's water sources. And those are the kinds of things that are governed by the water quality control standards set by the EPA and enforced at local, regional, and national levels. So let's look at both of those types of pollution so that you can understand the difference between them. Point source pollution I like to remember as the type of pollution where you can point to the source without any questions at all. My favorite example are most of the time factories are a really good example of point source pollution. We know where the pollution is coming from. We can point to it clearly. We can see what the factory is creating and then putting back into the environment. We call that point source pollution. Some farms are considered point source pollution. If you've got a huge farming operation and all of those cows, which is the example you see in the picture here, are adding waste into the environment, that waste consists of nitrates and phosphates. We looked at that earlier in your set of notes. And those nitrates and phosphates can end up in our water system adding pathogens and toxins and making people sick. Now, why is it point source pollution? Because if it's an intensive farming operation, you can point to it and say, I know where the waste is coming from. All them cows over there. That's point source pollution. Now, in many ways, we always look at point source pollution and we think to ourselves, oh, that's obviously dangerous. Right? If a factory is pumping toxic sludge into a river, I don't think any of us have a question in our minds that that's a bad thing that needs to be addressed by all kinds of water quality standards and enforcement at the local, regional, and national level. Now, here's the thing, though. In many ways, I think that non-point pollution might be the more dangerous of the two. So non-point source pollution is pollution that ends up in our freshwater systems, but you can't really identify the individual source of the pollution. A really simple example is city streets over here. Have you ever gone to like a store's parking lot after a rainstorm and looked at the puddles of water on the ground and seen like shimmery, rainbowy, golden, and, and reds and oranges and blues? Well, guess what you're seeing? That's pollutants that have burbled up from the parking lot and mixed in with that water that's on the parking lot. And you just happen to be able to see it because there's a puddle of it sitting right in front of you. Well, remember that those same pollutants are all over the street in your subdivision. And when it rains, that sludge is washed up from the pavement and washed directly into your storm drains, isn't it? But because we don't know exactly who it is that has the car that's leaking contaminants, it's difficult to call that point source pollution. We can't point to the person who's causing the pollution and require them to take steps to fix it. Another really interesting example is suburbs and suburban development. Sometimes when you have suburbs 
what ends up happening is they rip up all of the grass that used to form a barrier between the suburb and between the river or creeks or streams that are nearby. And once that happens, when it rains, all of the pollutants and contaminants from the suburb roll directly into the creeks or rivers or streams that are nearby. What recommendations are, or what the EPA recommends, is that when you build a suburb, you should leave a buffer or a barrier in between the suburb and the river or creek or stream that's nearby. Those buffers are called riparian boundaries or riparian buffers. And by leaving that land, what you end up with is sort of like a natural filter. When pollutants run through the grass or run through the foliage that's growing in the riparian buffer, it gets trapped in the soil as opposed to ending up in our freshwater systems. However, the people who build suburbs don't like that too much. Why? Well, they don't like it because you're telling them that they have to leave some land without building homes on it. If you're building a subdivision, you want to build as many homes as you possibly can. That's non-point source pollution. Why? Because you don't know who's causing the problem. Another really interesting example of non-point source pollution in a suburb is guys like me. I feel really bad about this. You know, I have a company that comes and fertilizes my lawn. So they're putting nitrates and phosphates on my grass so that my grass will grow healthy and green. Guess what happens when it rains, though? All of those nitrates and phosphates from the fertilizer run directly into the street, get carried directly into the storm drain, and end up in your drinking water. Thanks, Mr. Verriter, right? We call that non-point source pollution because we can't really identify the individual person who's responsible for it. Now, here's what's interesting to me, and in some ways I think it's troubling to me. All of the regulations that we have around water quality target non or point source polluters. So there's all kinds of regulations about what factories can do. There's all kinds of regulations around what commercial farmers can do. And that has helped. It's improved water quality over time because those polluters aren't polluting into our freshwater system as much as they used to. However, the regulations that we have around water quality do not govern non-point sources of pollution. So to me, that feels like we're only fighting half the battle. To me, I sort of wish that we would create regulations that could somehow fix the issue around non-point source pollution too. If we could, I think we'd have cleaner and safer drinking water. Hey, by the way, I don't know if your teacher plans on teaching this or not, but there's a really interesting series of conversations around hog lagoons in North Carolina. Remember, we're one of the nation's leading pig producers. And whether those hog lagoons, which store hog waste, whether they are point source pollution or non-point source pollution. Ask your teacher about that and see if you can hear what those conversations and rules have looked like in the state of North Carolina. It's a fascinating connection between science and politics.